So that was kind of cool. I was, you know, ahead on what Javier was and was doing, you know, five years back about because of that connection to my comic book series. And of course, I was a fan then because I'm like, oh, okay, an ANCAP guy who likes cosplay and comics? I'm in. <laughs> so this sounds great. Do you feel continually let down by modern media? Do you miss the good old days, back when all that mattered was a good story and not some agenda? Do you have ambitions of picking up a pen and pad and fighting the creative war yourself? Then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I'm going to talk to a creator who said enough is enough and started making the content they wished was out there. Join us as we discuss the ups and downs of the self-publishing world. We want to help empower you to join the Iron Age of media. Welcome to Iron Age Marketing. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Iron Age Marketing. I am Nikki P. here as always. Today's guest, we have Jack Lloyd. How are we doing today, Jack? Hey, Nikki, I'm doing great. I am... Uh currently thrilled with what's going on right now in the world. Uh, I really enjoyed G-1, that new Godzilla movie, and I enjoyed hearing that Javier Malay went and slashed half the agencies in Argentina. So those are two wins. Well, you hope. I'm still hearing rumors he's meeting with Biden and the Clintons and stuff, which just weirds me out. But, you know, maybe he was just taking saxophone tips from Bill, in which case... <laughs> You know, uh, so <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned it because I was going to point out you're like you know a lot of people are complaining and you said you know coming into this before we were on it's like this has been probably one of the best years you've ever had and just rocking and rolling and so I'm glad to hear that. Is that translated into the business of creation for you this year? Definitely, I, I've you know had a lot of great successes this past year and all kinds of you know, business endeavors or things that we do with our publicity that, you know, involves fundraising. So, um, you know, we had a great start to the year. Uh, my wife and I uh, were flown out to Washington for the uh, LP Washington event there where we got to do a little bit of headlining and musical performances, which was really cool. Uh, we got to go uh, to Porkfest and give some talks and do two uh, musical performances, which was Amazing, of course, to be up there in the mountains and it's beautiful out and, and to be out with a bunch of people who really love Liberty and be able to do summer music was, was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to produce my latest nonfiction book, uh, which is a Philosophical Voluntarism, and I was thrilled about that uh, just because that kind of completes my primer trilogy of my nonfiction books, The Definitive Guide to Libertarian Voluntarism, A Vision for a Libertarian Future, and now Philosophical Voluntarism. I know it's a lot of words and a lot of syllables, but, you, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, deep content in there, so it matches it. And we did a music video called Break the Great Reset, which we uh, successfully funded and shot in downtown Tampa. And that was amazing. That came out beautifully, one of our best music videos. And right now, uh, one of the big things we're working on is my comic book campaign, Voluntarist Suit Saga 1, uh, which is the second arc of the Voluntarist comic series after the first one, which is Voluntarist Origins. And right now, the campaign's sitting at 8.1K, uh, which is 162% of our goal with still 18 days left. And we haven't even done a live stream promotion, which normally is a big part of that, is doing some live stream games to help support. But we haven't even done that yet. Um, so it's been a rocking year for <laughs> our uh, production and our music, our books, uh, comics, all this good stuff. Um, so I've been very thankful to everyone who's been a part of that and believed in us and grown with us uh, as we've done higher and higher level production things. So. Now, I'm curious, uh, what have been the big changes, you know, from this year to years past? Yeah, so I would say the biggest change from a, a you know marketing, public relations, advertising standpoint is that I've gotten more aggressive about reaching out to potential supporters early. So one of the things that, you know, I would do in the past was I would be a little bit more passive with some of my outreach in some ways, you know, whether it was running an ad on Facebook, you know, that kind of thing, or just sharing some content. Um, it, it was 
you know, effective here and there, but not really as, as much as direct connections. And in my early days, I did a lot of direct outreach, but then because of certain uh, metric issues with Facebook and how they changed things, it became very hard to do that as effectively. And some of the tools I had, you know, got sunsetted. And so I was kind of in this lull between uh, then and now figuring out what's the best way to reach people because, you know, I have all these different friends and fans over the years, but even people who actually re- would like to support don't get my content, right? They don't get it necessarily service to their feed just because their friends you on Facebook even follow your page. Uh, the reach is, is horrific and it's only gotten worse. And even though I've played many games with the algorithms and tags and ways to do things and ways to hack around things, and I've been successful in those ways, of course, getting some things viral here and there. It's been brutal anytime it involves potentially fundraising or you know sales. So I had to just go back to the root and do direct messaging to people and really just let them know in advance. So a part of that it was using Indiegogo's tools and other tools we have for collecting email addresses, like telling people, hey, we're going to be doing this thing coming up, direct message them, would you sign up for the email list? And of course, doing that, I got a bunch of people who were like, yeah, actually, I do want to know when that comes. And then... Even there, just because they're on the email list doesn't mean it necessarily reaches them, right? There's sometimes the issue that it can go to spam. Maybe their inbox had other priorities and they clicked it and then they forgot about it and it went to another page, whatever it is. There's lots of reasons why people don't follow up even though they get on your email list. So looking through those and following up with people directly, uh, messaging them and reminding them again, like, oh, hey, you know, the campaign's going, we're doing all this other stuff. Um, That was very successful for me, uh, being able to reach out to people directly. And I think the personal touch there is very important because, you know, people could spam message somebody. And I think how it qualifies spam as opposed to personal messaging is, you know, spam is just sent out with any particular individual touch to it without any um, opportunity to talk with the individual if they have follow-up, right? You know, if it's just a message to them and then you just ignore them, well, that's, you know, that's where you get spammy. But for me, I directly message people and it's me doing it. It's not some bot. It's not someone over in India or in the Philippines. <laughs> you know, I'm the one doing it. And so when someone messaged back, oh, hey, this was whatever's going on, I'm personally responding and letting them know what's going on. I'm, you know, talking to them about what's going on with their life. And it's personal in that way because it's like, no, I really care about this and I'm, I'm personally letting you know. And I think that's kind of important um, these days because there's just so many different ways that people are being advertised to and emailed and all this other stuff. And, and with the algorithms on top of that, it's just very hard to get people's attention uh, in the noise and in, in the cloud of things. And so personally, I've seen for myself being aggressive in, you know, not an offensive way, just aggressively, consciously trying to reach out to people, get them, you know, to join in on an email list or whatever, newsletter, or whatever, then following them, them directly afterward. I think that's been very important. And I think that there will probably be even more as, as technology uh, progresses, more need for alternative means to reach people, like personalized um, physical mail things and other types of ways that subvert the clutter that's, you know, an online advertising um, and even with, you know, adver- advertising advertising that's uh, done in a kind of, uh, you know, boosted way, uh, you know, online uh, where you might boost a post or something like that as opposed to just taking an ad. When I first messaged you about this, You'd actually had said, I'm, at this point, I'm considering just sending out postcards at the, again, you know, old snail <laughs> mail, because at least I know they'll get there in theory. <laughs> it, it's true. It, like, I, I, I'm, I am actually genuinely almost at that point now where I'm, I'm probably going to consider seriously doing that um, in the future, maybe making some type of voluntarist art card, like a cool postcard that makes you go, what's this, right? Because it looks cool, um, you know, with some characters drawn, this or that, and letting people know about a campaign. Because in some ways, that's going to be more readily received than just, oh, I made a Facebook post and, okay, 10 people saw it, right? That's where it's at for me. And I have a lot of different pages. I manage a lot of big pages, everything from a few thousand followers to over 100,000 followers. So I have pretty good dynamic range of seeing, you know, what these types of reaches are, what kind of messages work, memes, other things, videos, you know, across the board, because we create all kinds of content here. So uh, it's just... It's just so hard to get people to commit, you know, to buy in. And again, it's not necessarily because, you know, you even have a bad product or something like that. It's just that there's that much out there. And so you have to stick out and you have to like really almost get in someone's face and be like, hey, by the way, check this out. I know you're busy. I know everything's going crazy, but check this out. I promise you're going to like it, you know, so. Well, as a case study, like 
Facebook, just as an example. I have a Facebook account that I use. I, I only have it so I can keep Facebook Messenger. That's it. Like, I'm so rarely on Facebook and so rarely interact that it just might as well not exist. But I don't want to give up years of Messenger that I've had talking <laughs> to people. Like, that's literally the only reason I keep. Right. So it's like, yeah, you've got all these followers, but how many of these people have given up because they've been so abused by the platform that they're on? You know, it's like, oh, I've got 100,000 people that follow me on any given thing, but they're sick of not being shown the things they want to. Um, I, I, even this, so I'm going to tell you right now, Facebook changed their algorithm probably within the past couple of days ago because for whatever reason did pop into the app. And now all of a sudden I'm seeing hundreds of names that I've never seen suggested to me for friends. Right. Like people. And I can tell from the types of people they are. It definitely has something to do with the elections coming up. There are <laughs> people that I have hardly anything in common with. The only thing I can tell you is that they're all of a very specific political bent that is not my own. <laughs> so clearly they want me interacting with a lot of Joe Biden fans. Uh, that's funny. But it's always weird when you can, you can literally see the app trying to manipulate you. And you're like, why, why am I here? And then there's no trust. So if I can't trust the app to provide me with anything, even if you have the best product available, I'm now going to assume that anything that I'm being shown by the app isn't to my interests and tastes and that there's some type of angle being played. And so now you're being screwed as a creator by the platform itself. Like I can't trust you now because I can't trust the app and the app showing me you, even if in the best faith way, like it made it to me, <laughs> I can't trust it now. And that's, that's gotta be frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I'd certainly would think that plays into some people's frustrations. I know there's all different types of issues that have come up at this point, you know, with, the censorship issues, you have the uh, manipulation algorithms, you have, um, you know, just people being frustrated that whatever they post doesn't get to the people that they care the most about. And they're like, well, you know, does nobody love me, right? So <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very frustrating process um, to curate that. It can be done, and I have successfully done that. Like, I, I'm very steeped and I understand how to always roll with the, the changes and to curate accordingly. But it, who does it as a regular person? Right. But the bottom line is, is you're a creator. You don't want to spend right. all of your time learning how to exactly. be an expert of the Facebook algorithm. Exactly. You want to write books about guys in spandex fighting other guys <laughs> in spandex. That would be nice. But yes, it, it is a serious endeavor to try to curate what you do and make sure that, you know, you're not having a bunch of followers or fans that are people who would never support you or people who are, hate you and, you know, won't even like your content, and then you're wondering why it's getting ghosted. So th th there's a factor there too that has to be taken into consideration where it's like, what, you know, what's your purpose with what you do? Some people, of course, use social media on a small scale where it's like, it's mostly their friends and family, like actually, and they have a few Liberty people, maybe 10 Liberty people, and that's it. You know, and there's people who are like, I'm going to add every single person that Facebook suggests to me. And they're like, how do you have 5,000 friends and 5,000 followers? And you're like, but they're just nobody. They're just, you know, sitting alone and you know, whatever, they just click on every single thing anyway, you know, because that's all they have time for, you know. I learned my lesson pretty early with that. <laughs> I've, I've just spent the past five years getting rid of all those people that spam added me because I right. like something by <laughs> some libertarian <laughs> thing. Right. I, that's what you have to do. You, ha you have to curate, but if you have a business purpose, you know, when you do those things, you know, especially if you're working for a certain particular, whatever it is, you, do, you could be making bill time, you could have a marketing agency, whatever it is that you're doing that you're trying to curate for, if you're purposeful in that, then you, you can successfully do it, but it just takes work. That just is a part of the business thing. And I have, of course, things that are just, you know, friends for liberty purposes, of course, and I keep people who are in the same mindset, you know, share at least relatively same values. And of course, there's things that I'm doing intentionally try to curate a fan base, right? I have, I have both a fan base aspect of things where it's like, okay, I want to reach the people who love my comic. And then I also have people who, who are like, I don't necessarily like comics, but I like what you do, right? You know, and maybe they would support something else with this, that, or they'd share something, but they're, they're not comic fans. It's fine. It's, it's just recognizing that, you know, divide. That brings me back to the fact, so when we opened up, you've, you started talking about the fact that you have three nonfiction books you've written. You and Fo have the, the music angle. So while you're a creator, you have very different outputs, and I'm going to imagine that the audiences are not the same. Obviously, the same people that like the Voluntaries comic book or not the people that, you know, go to Philosopher's Gun Channel. <laughs> right. You're, you're going right. to have a different cross-sections and different people interested in all that. 
what are the what's the is there a way that you delineate in your head the ways in which you reach all those different organs or those different cross sections of people it all and let the chips fall where they lie kind of thing because at the end of the day you know people who genuinely like your content are not going to be too offended when you're sporadically changing up or this or that it's more if it becomes a consistent thing i think for example eric july he had this recent issue because he spent so much time building up his his YouTube channel on critiquing things that were going on in mainstream in the culture, right? He was critiquing Marvel DC as more of his, you know, regular thing. And people became accustomed to that, right? They're like, that's what I'm used to seeing. I want to go see what he has to say about the latest thing, right? But then he switched to business mode. And now everything is about Ripperverse, right? So there's some people who, who voice their frustration that, oh man, I miss your updates on what's going on in, in, in the culture uh, with Marvel DC or whatever else comic world. You know, I want, I, you know, I miss some of that. And, you know, he, to which he responded, yeah, he's like, I get it. He's like, you know, that's going to be not as much as because I want to do the business thing. So you just kind of pick and choose what um, you want to do at the end of the day. But if, if you mix it up enough, you're not going to lose really too many people. You know what I mean? If, if you still throw in some stuff here and there, right, you throw in for us, like, okay, if you have gun content, okay, we throw in some memes about that. Or, you know, maybe do a video that relates to that or whatever. It's just, um, it's if you totally abandon it, then yes, people are going to get tired of that if you've built an audience exclusively on one thing. But from the beginning, we've always built up on a, a whole variety of things. And so I think we probably have been able to stand the test of time a little bit better than others because we've always been a we're doing everything kind of, th- you know, thing we're, we're we've never been. Oh, we're just this one thing. So, you know, that, that, it definitely uh, has a little bit of unique nuance for us as opposed to someone who's like, I'm going to be so focused, laser focused on this one area, and now I'm going to switch because, oh, I want to do this other thing. Well, that's, that's going to be tougher. You know, it's going to be a bit tougher. I mean, I personally miss all the, you know, honest teacher school content, <laughs> education <laughs> content from back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I still post some of the old memes. Sometimes I'll make an occasional new one here and there. There is something that is tangentially related to that on that note, um, that is a new project that's coming out on January 1st, 2024. So you might have your fancy tickled uh, <laughs> on that release. Are you starting a school finally? Like, uh, Not yet. That is something down the road. The Jack V. Lloyd School of Comic Book Creation, maybe? <laughs> that, that is actually something we're very serious about because basically, unless someone makes a, a really great one, a really great self-directed learning center, by the time me and Fuzz's kids are about the time they might be interested in that, then we're going to definitely create our own. So down the road, we will create um, a voluntarist-oriented, and I say that as opposed to the Sudbury democracy-oriented uh, self-directed learners that are not that, you know, not that they're bad or anything or you know, whatever. It's just I, I, I do take a little bit of a philosophical difference between the Sudbury Valley model where their focus is democracy. They are a little bit more, yeah, democracy. We're like, mm, yeah, not really yeah, democracy, yeah. but, you know. More so just participation than democracy. But, we, you know, we would like to create something of that nature down the road, if, especially if that's not an opportunity that's readily available for our kids. So we've chatted a lot about, like, the, the marketing stuff. Tell us about what you're actually promoting right now. So we've got the origin series out of the way for your voluntarist comic. Where are we going right now in the story? So right now, the Suit Saga arc is what's popping over on Indiegogo. And that is, by the nature of the name, talking about how Voluntarius comes to don his suit. So the, the major uh, thought there, you know, in terms of that arc is, okay, so where does he go from here and why does he get his suit? How does that come about? That kind of thing. That said, that's not the only thing that's within Suit Saga. It, there's tons of new characters, new development you know, of, of action and, and intense questioning of what's going to happen. So there, there's a lot going on, but it's just kind of like that's the one main theme. Hey, okay, this is where Voluntarius gets his suit, but then there's a lot more that comes with it. And you can kind of see that because the cover has the arch nemesis of Voluntarius Leviathan on there. And clearly that has, doesn't have anything to do with his suit. So you can already see that we're going that direction of more and more characters being introduced, especially enemies and developing the story in a way that you, you can really see where this is going to be heading into the future. What, you know, what is the protagonist going to do? 
So how long before Javier Millet gets introduced into the comic series? Do we have to wait a year and see how he does <laughs> on Argentina before he's a character? Or? That's funny. Well, you know, they did a funny uh, comic mock-up of him. I think it was Students for Liberty who paid an artist to make him um, El General uh, Ancap uh, against Peronism in the, in the image. And he had his Captain Ancap costume, which was uh, created by cosplayer Lilia, uh, I'm going to butcher the last name, I think it's Lemony. But I don't know if there's a different Spanish way of saying that. But so she uh, designed his costume back in the day and he wore that along with her own costume on different shows and at a convention. And that costume was designed after she looked at Voluntarius, my comic series. So she had reached out to me and had mentioned that she was looking at Voluntarius symbols and had come across my series and she was designing the suit for Javier and trying to figure out what to do. So that was kind of cool. I was, you know, ahead on what Javier was and was doing, you know, five years back about because of that connection to my comic book series. And of course, I was a fan then because I'm like, oh, okay, an ANCAP guy who likes cosplay and comics? I'm in. <laughs> so this sounds great. So I was a bit ahead, you know, paying attention. Is that super weird to you that like in some small way you're, you've officially been kind of placed into the world of global politics, which is <laughs> not a place libertarians usually find themselves. Usually they yeah. try to keep them as far away from that as possible. But Jack, in like the most sneaky and backhanded way, snuck his way in the back door. <laughs> I mean, it, it's true that, um, you know, when you do the kind of work we do, you definitely get more of an international following because the artwork and the music and stuff like that can transcend our context here, you know, in America. And for example, um, our song that we produced, Ancap Grind, uh, you know, the philosopher did that one. That was her big first, like, official music video before, you know, we did a parody one before. That's like the official music video. She did that, and that was very popular with Brazilians and the Portuguese-speaking uh, population. At some point, I've got to go back and read the article that me and uh, some people wrote about that. I think that was the first video that we commented on for our Freedom Song 365 project we did back in like what 2018 maybe it was it was a long while ago but we started uh started with that particular track <laughs> I just got to show the love man I got to support the people out there doing shit you know I I appreciate that and it still holds if up I, it's still like it still holds up so that's what I love about it is if, if I have to choose a favorite song out of that project I'm probably going to lean towards uh what is it the government can by um uh -huh. Tim so, something. He's just some Christian musician, but it's hilarious because it's uh, the Candyman can. Right, 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 right. Willy yeah, Wonka. yeah. That. Oh my yeah. goodness, though, but it's so yeah, so ridiculous. Man. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, uh, this is a personal question here that I've never gotten like a, a, a serious Christian vibe from you. Uh, obviously, I know your ethnic background, so that would be weird, but. Uh, do you ever find it odd the number of uh, Christians that we spend our time around in the space? You know, <laughs> given yeah, like it's like to me, it was always weird that like well, all of a sudden I'm palling around with like hardcore Catholics and now <laughs> lots of Orthodox Christians, and it's a weird place for an atheist like myself to find myself. Is there some reason that those people are drawn to all that, do you think? Or is, is it as weird for you as it is for me, I guess? I understand it pretty well. Uh, for, you know, just my own background. You know, I, I grew up in an evangelical messianic home, very in tune with everything from 700 Club to Focus on the Family and all that stuff that went on, especially in the 90s. You know, grew up watching Veggie Tales, Adventures in Odyssey, the Hanna Barbera cartoons, you name it. I've done it around the world. So, uh, very familiar with, with uh, Christianity, both in a uh, American context, global context, and a cultural context. And I would say the liberty portion definitely makes sense, I would say, for Protestantism, because obviously Protestantism was itself kind of a resistance to the centralization of Christian teaching within the Catholic Church. And that was a rebellion movement. And it was even further a rebellion movement with the American experience, because they were also being persecuted by the Church of England. So that's why they came to America was, you know, for that religious freedom. Now, of course, some of those people, you know, tried to go after each other too, the Puritans, stuff like that. But ultimately that led to the separation of church and state concept because they just wanted to not have persecution, right? They want freedom for a few of the different Christian denominations, uh, religious practices. So 
I understand that kind of anti-authoritarian drift uh, that that is existing, especially within American uh, Christianity. Uh, I would say that there's certainly been, especially because of, of government and the, the persecution, or at least culturally as, as Christians would perceive it, persecution of, of Christians is how, you know, uh, many Christians would, would perceive it. Because of that, they've, they've especially grown a distaste for the state, you know, you know when, in terms of what they historically thought was, um, you know, the uh, left side taking over in the post-2000 world. And that becoming more normalized, you know, in terms of government structures, um, in terms of leftist social norms, um, they would certainly see that as an affront and want to exit, you know, out of that. So just, you know, by the nature of that being like, oh, and the state's especially gross now because of who's in power and this and that. So I definitely understand that the Catholic is a lot tougher to me. That one is actually, I'd say that one's the more unusual one is, is the Catholic side of things. And the only reason I think the Catholic side of things even you know, got to the popularity it was is because Lou Rockwell is a Catholic. When he made the Mises Institute, um, he was having Rothbard write rehabilitation pieces for Catholicism and combining that with libertarianism, even though the majority of of Catholicism, culturally speaking, is is typically more state planning favored, um, more leftist, um, I would say. There's certainly a lot of Catholics who are conservatives, but that's a big difference between a global scale of total Catholics and the political thing supported more often by popes and bishops and stuff like that. So it's a little bit different of a divide there. I think that um, the appeal on, on the shared doctrine, though, from the Austrian economics perspective, is that technically Mises kind of has his whole framework from this a priori backdrop where it's just like you think of it in metaphysics and and humans act and they're this abstract man and they work deductively from this assumption of truth. And assumption of truth is very popular within faith-based um, religion because if, you know, you have this idea that, oh, okay, this is just the uh, apparent truth, right? You just, you just see it or you don't and you go from there kind of thing. That ties to a lot of, of people who have that, you know, shared thought process with Christianity of like, oh, I'm just, you know, I see the truth of God and it's just, you just experience it. And they think that too, when they think about the foundations, I think of the assertions of Austrian economics and, and that being kind of just an a priori uh, assertion. Uh, I, I don't take that. I definitely have a, a, a divergence there. I'm more of an empirical person so there was it was an actual reason I asked this question before we get because I know that you're a politics guy and you, like me that's where we come from. But <laughs> yeah. there was actually a reason, a marketing reason I asked that question because certainly a lot of the people in the types of subgenres and we'll say groups that we would find ourselves marketing to, you're going to find an overnumeration of Christians of various varieties, conservatives, and that things like that. Now we've had a huge event, you know, as in October, that where a lot of those conservatives had come together on a lot of different things that we would support. There's now been kind of like a bomb thrown into a lot of that, and people have kind of started splintering off again. How does that affect, as far as like you're approaching your avatars and the way that you're looking at people from a marketing perspective? Is it something that you just try to askew? Or is it a way that you have found to kind of manage to keep the groups together in some way for your own purposes? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, no, I, I've definitely have had to change what it is that I guess you could say I tolerate more so because I don't really change my principles. I don't pander in that direct way, you know. So I'm I'm going to be consistent or vocal about what I think, even if there's a loss. Um, because we're like, oh, well, you know, you support this or that. I don't even know what sometimes when people say because they're just uh, making up all kinds of stuff. But, you know, I, fundamentally, I, I find it to be more valuable to just, you know, be principled for myself and to speak on that unabashedly and, and to, to roll with whatever may come from that. Of course, in a business perspective, you know, and this is for mainstream business too, I mean, Lots of business people intentionally keep quiet about anything controversial because they just want to make deals. Well, they used to. Right. It's like, oh, okay, well, if you if you open up, well, now you're gonna affect your business. And what and then they save their controversy for cigar talks by a fire with friends, right? That's when they have their 
I'm going to smoke a cigar, drink whiskey, and talk the politics that I can't talk about, you know, in my day-to-day business because, you know, don't want to lose sales. So, you know, I, I, I would like to think that I don't compromise for the sake of sales. I definitely would not compromise my principles. Certainly, I might think about how I say something and make sure it's not alienating, like, unnecessarily. Uh, I'm not going to call someone stupid or say, you're all bad or this or that just because I'm going to, I'm going to choose my words in a way that's just more about reason, evidence, and the ideas. I'm curious what you think about like the creators that go out there and seem to make an entire career out of throwing bombs, essentially. To me, like whatever short-term gains you get out of like short-term controversy and being like the in the eye, it, it, it just doesn't ever seem to translate to long-term staying power in anything. Like, the minute that controversy is up, like, whatever effort you put into it, it's kind of up, too, it feels like. Yes, and you can't do that um, frequently and, and, and in different sides without completely destroying any fandom you have, right? It's one thing to be like, okay, I'm going to always throw my controversial stuff, but in a direction, right? And you're consistent in that direction. It's like, okay, well, now you have this side of fan-based things, and people definitely do that. Yeah, I mean, this certainly, you know, it, it's it's something that can hurt your business and, and really hurt your fandom in the long term if you do that too sporadically and and, and keep offending people all across the board. You, you know what I mean? It, it's it's going to cost you, and that's why a lot of these people who are just you know Twitter shock jocks, you could be like, oh wow, they have nine thousand followers or some dumb thing, and they're like, yeah, and no one would literally lift a finger to help them do anything if they ever wanted to do anything. You know what I mean? It's like. And nobody cares. Like, they're all broke, dysfunctional people who follow you are bots. And it's like, okay, cool. It's like, that's why I laugh at this stuff. Because it's like, I, I don't care about my quantity of, of fans or followers. I, I, I care about the quality, right? I'd rather have 100 people who are fans of me who would show up to my event or show up to support what I do than 10,000 followers and maybe one would ever even support what I do. What's the point? You know what I mean? It's like, oh, okay, cool. I got 10,000 followers and okay, no one would show up for anything. That's why I like laugh at these people. I'm like, oh, wow. You, you think you're so cool because you have all these different, you know, whatever. I, I was on this podcast on that. I'm like, okay, cool. And uh, what does that mean for you in terms of your success? Right? It, it just doesn't mean anything because it doesn't translate to anything and nobody would lift a finger to support that person ever for anything. So that, you know, that's what matters to me. It's, I, I want quality over quantity always. Quantity is great, but not at the expense of, of quality. And that's a part of how I curate. I look for people who tend to be more long-term oriented and principled. I want I want to be friendly with those people. I don't want to be friendly with the the flash pan people who, you know, oh yeah, I'm a libertarian today and then, you know, 2 years later they're like, "And yeah, you're stupid and you're going to be in a box car." No, oh, I've got I've got some names I could throw there, but we'll, we'll stay out of it. <laughs> yeah. There's certainly some people. You know, so it, it's just one of those things where you know, I value people who are are more long term oriented in that way and more principled. Doesn't mean I don't do outreach. I do outreach all the time to people. But you don't have to be my buddy, buddy, close friend for that. It's just enjoy my content on the outside. But that doesn't mean okay, you have to be you know arm in arm inside my Facebook. You know what I mean? It you know learn on the outside with my public posts or this or that. And then if you become more principled and you're like, oh yes, I really you know I value these things and I really you know want that, then you know then there's opportunity for whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a different paradigm for us if we're in a, a, a more ideological, uh, you know, kind of grouping. You know, we're not out here selling hot dogs. So it's, 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 a, little bit, it's a little bit different, you know, when, when you're trying to deal with products that inherently have either an outright or undertone message for liberty. It's, it's going to have a little bit of a different angle in how you rally people around that. So I, the one thing I'll say is, the the word that I always throw around because it's probably the most important word in marketing and people never think of it this way and it's it's about relationships. It's it's always about relationships. It's about you know putting out the good faith, finding the people that are you know going to buy your products, ingratiating yourself to them, finding the people that are willing to help you, ingratiating yourself to those people, and you know you want to try and waste as little time as you can on people that are just in it for themselves. And you'll trust me, you'll know them pretty damn quick because <laughs> it's never about, Hey, I'd love to help you. It's about, well, what can you do for me? 
And the bottom line is, it's it's it's, it's it should be okay to ask people for help because we all need help. But you can't like have all of the help rely <laughs> on what someone else is going to be able to bring to the table. I guess. Right, and it's certainly for a close circle. Yeah. I think we've honestly had enough, had, had, had a great show here. I could belabor it, keep you on, keep you longer. Why don't you tell us uh, where uh, people can go to pick up your product or pick up the voluntarist suit and uh, anywhere else you want to sh- send them to to pick up stuff? Yeah, I would love that. Um, if you check out on Indiegogo, Voluntarist Suit Saga 1, you know, basically just go to Indiegogo, search in Voluntarist, or you can go to my website. V-O-L, that's V as in voluntarist, V-O-L-C-O-M-I-C, volcomic.com. It'll get you over there too. And to my newly released print copies of Voluntarist Origins. Uh, So we have been waiting three months for them to finally post it because they were backlogged from just so much stuff, um, you know, at at the uh, printer and at the the print-on-demand company. So they finally got it out. Now you can actually get this beautiful trade paperback uh, which has all the one through six issues inside of it, along with this beautiful full wrap cover. And on the back, it says, what does it mean to be truly free? And I'm, I'm just very proud of this work because we actually spent like a year and a half doing a remaster because the, the first two issues were done with a different company that went defunct, different artists. We wanted to tune everything up. So we redid the covers on the one through five. We redid issues one and two. I lettered it all myself. So now everything is uniform. It's beautiful. I'm proud of it. I have production control in my hands now. So the quality control is there. And of course, my wife, Fa, is a great help at, you know, that quality control and assurance. So I am so proud of it. I'm, I'm super thrilled. Like before I was a little embarrassed and I like didn't want to tell people about voluntary because I'm like, oh gosh, there's so many things that I need to fix. Now it's, you know, the floodgates are opened. I'm like, go get it, pick it up. I am not ashamed of what I have. I have, you know, worked so hard to make this beautiful and engaging. And now, you know, we have the next arc coming out, which is, again, a continuation of that beautiful and engaging content. So how long have you been working on the Voluntarist comic? Like from the the first thought of issue one to the release of this particular, uh, you know, trade paperback? Yeah, about, um, you know, you could say 11 years uh, because the, there was a precursor to Voluntarist where I did this cosplay thing with my brother and we like held up signs saying taxation is theft outside. It was kind of this funny, goofy thing that we did. And then years later, you know, because I liked cosplay and comics, I eventually got to the point where I was going to develop Voluntarist into a comic book. And this was in 2012 uh, when I was writing that script while I was studying for the bar exam. So I then that, that fall did my first Voluntarist campaign. And then for the first five-ish years, I was you know, in the trenches, working on things, having failures, making mistakes, and doing then changes to do Futureverse prototypes to build some excitement back, and then eventually coming to the point like, okay, I got my, you know, pretty much my hands around this, and I started the Origins series. And then since that time, I had more improvements to do, but since that time, about five-ish, six years ago, I uh, kept building the actual canon origin story. And that just flourish because, you know, after I had my first Origins uh, 1, every campaign since then has been over 100% funded. Everything has been, you know, super uh, well, you know, orchestrated. And and I'm really proud of of what we're able to offer now because it's just perfect. And I have, you know, everything in, in a way where I don't have to worry anymore that things won't be good because I took back the reins of of the uh, management, whereas before it was with a, an intermediary company, you know, they, they kind of orchestrated things. And I was like, no, I, I can't do this anymore. So I, I just got tired of, of the, the issues and the problems. Like, you know what? I can do this. So now that it's in my hands back again, it's just amazing. I'm, I'm very proud of it. Uh, the reason I did ask that question is because for the guys out there struggling to put out that first product, uh, you're probably not going to be happy with it after it's done. The point is, is you have to start the process. You have to learn the process. You have to go through the process. And you can always touch it up later. There's a reason for second editions. There's a reason people, you know, re-release things. Because sometimes you got to put out what you got to put out to start building that fan base. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for coming on again. Uh, this will be. I think when this actually airs, you'll be the first guest that's actually had their uh, episode out that I've had on twice. Oh wow! I like it. I love the being first for people. It makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any 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 last words you want to get out there for creators out there? 
Yeah, I, I think what you said was was exactly nail on the on the head there. Um, we're you know never going to get to our big successful production of whatever it is we want to do without starting somewhere, right? We're not going to be able to have an amazing outcome of a book, comic book, music, music video, whatever it is you want to do creatively until you actually go for it and experiment and play around and learn. And if you don't, you'll never be at the final point. You'll never get there. You'll never learn the skills. You never make the mistakes. You'll never have a chance to, to move forward. The thing is, just don't don't fail too big, right? Don't don't do something <laughs> where you do this. I'm going to run, fundraise a million dollars and goof in a big way where you get into debt and you're stuck or something. You know, yeah. Fail small, fail often, learn from those mistakes, but then grow along the way and keep growing. And eventually, just like any talented artist or whatever else, you'll get to the point where people say, "Wow, you're so good." But of course, they don't know all the the rough drafts you had and all the mistakes you had and the nights agonizing over, "Okay, wow, what do I do better?" You don't get to the best year you've ever had without realizing, I, I, I need to get rid of that company that's middle managing what I'm doing here. Exactly right. And and you don't get there, too, also without listening to some valid criticism and, and feedback as well where it's where it's merited, right? So I always say it, too, like, listen to feedback. Of course, if it's junk feedback, and you know it's junk because it's just calling you names, you know it's just denigrating you, it's just put-downs, right? That's not feedback. Feedback is, hey, I thought on this page, the you know speech bubble was not really legible or something was cut off. Or, oh, with your song, it sounded a little bit scratchy at you know, two minutes and three seconds. It sounded like it, you know, overdrove, right? The specific feedback that tells you something to fix, that's feedback, right? Where it's, you can check that objectively and know, okay. But someone just saying, oh, you're cringe, you're crap, that's not feedback, okay? So just keep that in mind. Look for feedback that's specific, check it, see, okay, does this make sense? Ask someone else, right? That's how you can grow as well. Well, as a marketer, I'd say that's actually quality feedback. It lets me know who my who my audience isn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stop. Pull that guy out of whatever marketing he was getting. Right. <laughs> well, once again, thank you so much for coming on, Jack. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Do you fancy yourself the next Tolkien, Lewis, or Barker? Maybe you just have something subversive to say. Hopefully, this podcast is helping you. But maybe your ambitions are just a little bigger than you can handle on your own head over to ironeedsmarketing.com and let Nikki P help ensure your book doesn't release to nobody.